Perfect. Okay. So welcome to the second session of the Manager Studio for uh, the 2015-16 school year. Our guest today is Brian Halligan, who's the co-founder and CEO of HubSpot. Prior to HubSpot, Brian was a venture partner at Longworth Ventures and a VP of sales at Groove Networks, which was later acquired by Microsoft. He has authored two books, Marketing Lessons from the Grateful Dead and Inbound Marketing, Get Found Using Google, Social Media, and Blogs, which he co-wrote with Dharmesh Shah. Brian serves on the boards of directors of Fleetmatics Group, a global provider of fleet management solutions, and the Massachusetts Innovation and Technology Exchange. Brian was named Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year in 2011, and one of Glassdoor's 25 highest rated CEOs in 2014. Please join me in a warm welcome for Brian Halligan. So I'd like to begin by asking you to talk a little bit about your company and give, give the students some perspective on what you do. Sure, who's heard of HubSpot? Great. Um, the basic idea of it's quite simple. Um, I used to be, as the, as the intro said, a venture capitalist. My job was to invest in startups, small companies, and help grow. And uh, when I meet with the founders and the sales folks and the marketing folks who are trying to grow their businesses, they uh, they all had a very similar playbook. They were going to buy a list and email people. They were going to buy a list and cold call people. They were going to do the big trade show. They are going to advertise as much as they could. They are going to hire the big PR firm in town. And, uh, and that's a playbook I had used my whole career. I sort of built my career on you know, implementing that playbook pretty well. But the, the, more and more, the more I looked at those plays and the more I looked at those companies, the more I came to the conclusion that those plays are broken, that people are sick and tired of being marketed to and sold to, and all of us are quite hard to reach and very clever at blocking the marketing te techniques out. Uh, most people today have caller ID, and you block out the unwanted calls. Most people have spam protection. Most people these days have ad blocker software. Most people have DVRs. It's just nearly impossible to reach a human these days using the traditional playbook. And so we came up with this idea of doing Instead of, out, we call it outbound marketing, how do you do inbound marketing? How do you turn marketing on its head and match the way you market with the way humans actually shop for stuff and buy stuff today? And we built a platform we called HubSpot. It's a software platform to enable marketers to make that shift. Uh, we started the company about nine years ago, right out of B school. I actually started sort of in B school. It was born out of business school. Um, and uh, it's gone pretty well. So far, so good. Okay, so to get into the interview. Let me question. tell you a story of how I was oh, born. Go, go. Maybe it's, uh, are, you, are you all uh, MBAs? Yeah, all the MBAs. Uh, um, so I was an MBA. By the way, people are down on MBAs these, these days. Have you heard about this? People are down on it. I think it's a bunch of BS. MBA, the MB, getting an MBA was the best decision I ever made. Um, you know, the way HubSpot got born was very much through, I went to Sloan, very similar type of thing as you guys are doing right now. And it was born of the Sloan school. So. It's an ideal, when you're a business school, it's an ideal place to start a company. I met my co-founder there, and I met the perfect co-founder. Like, if you drew a Venn diagram of, of sort of our interests, like, there's a solid overlap, but we have different skills we bring to the table and really complement each other. Business school is a great place to meet a co-founder because, if nothing else, they screen for, uh, you have to be halfway intelligent to get into business school these days. Uh, and then we decided to start the company. We pivoted a few times after we started, but we started it, and... Uh, you know, we, we needed some uh, money. <laughs> and, uh, and we raised an angel round of a million dollars in the first $100,000 one of our professors put in. So business school can be uh, useful from that perspective. Uh, <laughs> and then once we had the first 100000 down and we had a term sheet with our professor, Professor Roberts, uh, we just kind of put the word out there, raising a million dollar round and anyone who wants to kick it in. And the thing that was very surprising is we did almost our entire uh, angel round with our classmates. So it turns out we're sitting next to people in the class all year long and, uh, you know, they've got holes in their jeans and they're wearing flip-flops and it doesn't look like they've got a pot to piss in, but they're filthy rich. Uh, <laughs> and so we raised a million bucks from our classmates. It turns out our classmates' parents had a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> So that was useful. And then we're looking to uh, uh, hire some folks. And, you know, 10 out of our first 20 employees were classmates of ours or friends of classmates of ours. And, you know, 100% of our first, you know, you know, 10 out of our first 10 customers were classmates of ours that uh, took a risk on us early on. So 
if any of you are at all thinking about starting a company, coming out of business school is an awfully good time to do it. Uh, you're probably saddled with debt now. That's nothing compared with the debt you'll saddle yourself with when you've got a mortgage and car payments and kids and all that stuff. Um, so you're relatively debt free probably. Uh, and you're not burdened with conventional wisdom and old school thoughts. You're coming into a market full of uh, piss and vinegar. So if you're ever thinking of starting a company, right out of B school is a very good time to do it. Okay, so don't listen to any of that BS <laughs> about how business school isn't a good a lot on the West Coast. The conventional wisdom these days is what they do is they look at all the founders of the great tech companies, from Gates to Jobs to Ellison to you name it, and they don't have MBAs, and they've just done the math and said, well. Uh, business school is a waste of time. I disagree. Uh, we learned a lot in business school. We, we, we use a language of business that, that you learn in business school. It's like, it's like learning a language. It's great. Clearly, you're, you're preaching to the converted. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So Steve Jobs said you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backward. When you think about the path you've taken to get to this point, what are the most memorable experiences or moments that influence your thinking about becoming an entrepreneur? Yep. I never thought I'd be an entrepreneur. Um, Growing up, we had a neighbor, uh, his name was Richard Harrison, and he was that irritating kid in the neighborhood that did everything right. You know, do you have one of those in your neighborhood? He just did everything right. Went to the right school, president of his class, teacher's pet, my parents loved him, everyone loved this guy, Richard Harrison. He was really irritating. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't one of those types of guys, uh, but I admired him. I, I primarily admired him because everyone else admired him. And the path he took was through sales. He became a sales rep at, uh, Prime Computer, I think, local company here, did really well. He joined a company called Parametric Technology, PTC, right down the road, as a VP of sales when it was a real small company. And he joined the, uh, the founding team effectively there. Not the founding team. He was probably hired in as probably 15th, 20th employee. And he was the VP of sales and really rode that up quite nicely, eventually became the CEO and had a, a nice career there. And I was watching him as I was you know, 14, 15 years behind him. I'm in school and I said, well, that's a good path. That looks like a path that maybe I could do if I got lucky. And so he, he's been influential through my whole career just watching him. And so when I got out of school, I got a bunch of job offers. Um, and I got one that wasn't, the money wasn't very good. Uh, but I thought it was the right path. It was to, actually, I was, I was hired as his secretary. And so this guy's name is Dick Harrison, and I was his secretary. So I typed his memos. This is back when people had secretaries. Typed his memo, did his travel, you know, like the envelopes, mail crap for him. And, uh, you know, that was my path to try to get on that path. And then I went, to, I was VP of sales at another startup, and then I went back to business school. I never thought I would start a company. And uh, when, I, when I got out of business school, I kind of had three choices. I could go be a VP of sales, kind of at any good, really good company. Anybody would have me as a VP of sales. Or go be a CEO at any broken down company that no one else wanted to be CEO at. You know what I mean? I, was getting, I wasn't getting the good company CEO offers. I was getting the crap company CEO offers. Or I could join Darmesh, who's my co-founder, and start this thing at HubSpot. And honestly, it was a flip of the coin. I changed my mind every couple days. And, Darmesh caught me at a weak moment one day on the campus at Sloan and said, you know, don't be a wuss. Let, let's make this happen. You can do it. This is going to be great. You're going to become a CEO of a great company. You're going to make your own company. And he talked me into it. And I never thought I'd be talked into it. I never thought I'd be the idea guy. I always thought I'd be the support guy. And uh, it turned out to be a really good decision. So you built this really successful company in the inbound marketing space. Are there any notable disappointments or failures that played a role in how your career has unfolded? Yep. Uh, I would say I've made many, 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 many hundreds or thousands of mistakes, and I continue to do so. Uh, the thing that I've gotten right um, is I've joined high growth companies. Uh, that company, PTC, was high growth. I joined Groove Networks. I started a high growth company. And it turns out growth hides many of the mistakes you're making and most of the sins that are occurring inside of the business. And so if you're going to do anything when you leave, you're not going to start a company, join a high growth company because you'll, a rising tide tends to lift all boats. You'll get more responsibility. You'll see more of a movie uh, as opposed to you, you join a company that's not growing, yet the people above you aren't going anywhere. Uh, there's not that many new initiatives. It's just hard to get experience and learn. So you learn at hyper growth space time inside of, uh, inside of uh, uh, tech companies. 
companies. Um, the, thing I, the thing I was known for is when I was young, 26 or so, that company, PTC, that I started as a secretary, they moved me to Asia, to start Asia. And so I moved to Tokyo for a year, and then I was in Hong Kong for five years, back to Tokyo, back to Boston. I did a little round trip around Asia. And that's where I really cut my teeth and I learned was uh, I was essentially the founder of the Asian operation uh, for that company. And I got to do a lot and learn a lot and experiment a lot. And a lot, of my, uh, a lot of my formation was in those years. So a small company will give you that opportunity or a growth company will give you that opportunity, not necessarily a small company. Whereas a big stable company likely won't. So who are the individuals who had the greatest influence on your life, um, and, and what are a few of the insights or lessons that you learned along the way from them? Yeah, well, my mother and father for sure, uh, but on the business side, um, there are three sort of, I think of like those like bubbles over my head when I make decisions, three bubbles. Uh, one bubble is that guy, uh, Richard Harrison, Dick Harrison, PTC, guy I looked up to, irritating guy. Uh, and if I were to describe his political leanings, um, He's righter than right. He's righter than Donald Trump. Uh, so far right. Very confident, um, very right wing, and, uh, and he ran it like a right wing establishment. I don't know how to describe it in another way. He's very right wing. It's very sort of dog eat dog mentality. It was a tough place to work. Um, yeah, tough on the customers, tough on the employees. Uh, but I learned how to sell, and I learned how to scale, and I learned how to hire, and I learned how to scale, and a lot of stuff there. Then my next boss is a guy named Ray Ozzy. Ray Ozzy is kind of famous because he, he, uh, he created Lotus Notes. And um, he, was left, he was lefter than less. He was left of Bernie Sanders on the political spectrum. A very liberal sort of, very open-minded fellow. Um, didn't believe in the sales function per se. It was a necessary evil. Um, and cared deeply probably too deeply about his employees, care deeply, probably too deeply about his customers, um, almost to the, the detriment of the business. The business could have done much better. We, we sold to Microsoft. It could have been a much, much better outcome. Um, but I'm sort of a balance of those two, I feel like. And then Sloan is my third bubble. I learned a lot about innovation, a lot about myself, a lot about a lot, about a lot of stuff, a lot about accounting and finance and all that stuff at Sloan. And uh, those, those are the big three influence on, uh, on me. I tell you the thing I learned the first week at Sloan, and I don't know if any of you have had this experience, but the first week at Sloan, they broke us into little groups of 10, and they gave us hard problems to work on. And they sent us off and said, we'll work on this for a day and come back and present your results. And it's a kind of, kind of a leadership exercise. And so I remember I kind of took the lead. For some, for some reason, I wanted to take the lead. I, I thought, well, this is my chance. I'm going to take the lead in this group of 10, and I'm going to drive us to an answer, and this is going to be great. Because, uh, you know, I'm a wonderful leader. Uh, and so I took the lead. And I remember this is a South American guy, uh, Antonio, really smart guy. Uh, and, he, and I remember this first project was a tricky project. He, he had a different opinion, a different way to go, and I... And I my opinion, my opinion uh, I convinced the crew that my opinion was right. Um, and we got in the class, and, and I get up to argue, argue my case and made the thing. And it turns out I was dead wrong, absolutely dead wrong on my opinion. And this guy was dead right. Uh, it was like the first thing I did in Sloan. It's like, well, I don't know what I don't know, and I'm definitely not the smartest guy in the room. That has been helpful. Uh, it was humbling, like, bam, right out of the gate, humbling. And that's been helpful for the rest of my career. I forgot what the question was. <laughs> well, so the question is about the individuals that had the greatest influence. Yeah, so you've had your three bubbles. You yeah. answered perfectly. So um, you might have sort of answered it, but if, I don't know if there are mentors along the way who helped you as well, because uh, they can be a little more nuanced, a little more granular than these big bubbles that you have. And uh, Are there any mentors along the way, and, and how did they help you? I've never had a mentor. Um, I've never had anyone who say, I'm going to mentor you. Uh, I hear this from people at HubSpot all the time. They want a mentor, looking for mentorship. I never really had a formal one. I just tried to copy the people that I respected. So Dick Harrison and some of the other people at PTC were just wonderful. Some of the people at Groove were wonderful. And I just try to copy them throughout my career. So I've never really had a formal mentor. We do formal mentorship programs at HubSpot. People think they're great. I think it's a bunch of hogwash. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, Anyway, I never really had a formal mentor to answer the question. Okay, fair enough. I'm trying to develop a mentor. Do you guys know this guy, Jack Connors? Yes. 
a famous BC grad. I want him to be my mentor desperately. And so I don't know if I'm going to pull it off, but he, he, he is my definition. He started a company called Hill Holiday, and you're having the Hill Holiday. We are having a CEO. And he's got a similar background to my sales guy. Uh, he's a big BC grad, big BC boosters on, boosters on board trustees. He lived a, a life worth living. Uh, and now he's probably in his 70s, and he is, he's filthy rich, and he's full-time busy just trying to give as much money away as efficiently to the best causes he can find. He is just a wonderful man. So when I grew up, I wanted to be like Jack Connors. <laughs> so how did you develop your management and leadership skills, and what are some of the most important lessons you've learned along the way? Yep, 100% on the job training. Um, and uh, I'll give you a couple nuggets that I've learned since I've been in HubSpot. Interesting nuggets. Right point. Um, uh, we do this thing called, to be, raise your hand if you know what a net promoter score is. Okay, what a net promoter score is, you do it with your customers typically, where you ask your customers two questions, once a quarter, let's say. On a scale of one to 10, what's the likelihood you will refer my product or service to somebody else, okay? And then you ask, well, why? Okay, and then your net promoter score reflects how, how, how the word of mouth of your product is going to spread or not spread. And if you've got a low score, your word of mouth's not going to spread, your customers aren't ha happy, it's unlikely you're going to be able to build a big business. We've applied that to our employees. So we ask our employees once a quarter on a scale of 1 to 10, how likely are you to refer HubSpot as an employer to one of your friends? And then we say, why? Everybody with me? You guys with me over here? You with me? So we look at the score across the company, sort of a barometer of the happiness of our employees. Um, and then we look at it by department. And we look at it by department, it gets quite interesting. Um, I'll give you one example. Our, our services department, we have a head of services leadership that started with us, one of our Sloan buddies. And his score is cranking along pretty good in the mid-60s. That's actually a good score. And for years, mid-60s, nothing to worry about. Then bam, one quarter it went down to 40. Oh, that's interesting. So we sort of parsed his group's comments, you know, why, what's going on? A couple of comments about his leadership style, you know, a couple of pink flags, and then a bunch of comments about like issues, nagging issues in the business. So we wrote it up, gave it to this gentleman, and said, well, you got to fix this problem. You know, your score's getting bad. And so he's off and he's working on it. He's like, I got to fix it, and I, I'm a great leader, and I learned about that in business school, and let's go, go, go. And a quarter later, we, we looked at the score, and sure enough, it was, you know, started in the mid-60s, 40, boom, down to 18. And so it's dropping. And so we did the same thing, took the feedback, maybe they didn't get it, he needs another chance, did the thing, and then working on the whole thing. And then a quarter later, we, you know, went from 60, and then the 40, and the 18, what do you think it did? Zero. Negative, it actually can go negative. So that, <laughs> that, that was it for Jonah. We loved the guy, but it was time for him to go. And uh, then we replaced him with a guy named uh, Frank. And what do you think the score did the, the following quarter? What do you think? What do you think it did? 60. It's right, right exactly back to where it was in the mid-60s. Um, we've done that four times with four different leaders. And then the leaders we started out with from Sloan, basically, who have grown. And then there's something about them that breaks. It, it, you know, they're early stage chart people. And there's something about them that breaks. And, and uh, that's my first aha, is leaders break at some point. And the leaders are, are fits for certain size organizations. My second aha is, once you start to lose the confidence of your team, can't get them back. It's nearly impossible to win them back. So we've had the same slope curve for all four of them. My third aha is if you replace them with a capable leader, you can get the mojo back immediately. It doesn't take you years and years and years to claw back the confidence of that team. That's one kind of aha I have about management and leadership that's based in data that I think is quite interesting. Um, Another aha I kind of have, have had about uh, management is I've got this sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs in my mind where the base of the hierarchy pyramid is solve for enterprise value, EV, solve for the company, you know, solve for the stock price effectively. The next level up is solve for your team. And the next level up is solve for yourself. I found that the root of almost all, I won't call it evil, the root of all sort of poor management inside of HubSpot is when that, that pyramid gets flipped. And typically it isn't flipped on its head where self is on the bottom. It's people, immature managers solve for their team. They're managed by their team. They don't manage their team. And then 
it's themselves, and then it's the company. When they get that backwards, the incentives of that team, the motivations of that team, get really disconnected from where the company's going. Bad decisions happen, money gets wasted, customers get upset, all kinds of bad things will happen. So my other aha is I'm constantly vigilant on anyone solving for their team, anyone solving for themselves over the company. Whenever that happens, bad stuff happens. I had a third one, but I forgot what it was. If it comes back, we'll come back to it. So you've been leading HubSpot for over nine years and been at the helm for its meteoric rise. What have you learned about what it takes to build and run a successful organization from the ground up since you've scaled it from nothing to over 1,000 people now? Yeah. Do you have a pen? I do. Have you guys taken the innovation class yet in, at BC? OK, you'll get to this. Everybody see that? Black, can you see that? You guys see it in the back? OK. Doesn't matter. <laughs> this axis is time, OK? X axis is time. Y axis is growth. And there's an S curve in, it, in here. And this S curve describes the diffusion of an innovation into a marketplace, OK? And so let's take the iPod, OK? So the iPod starts out, doesn't do great at the beginning actually, it takes a while before it gets going, but it's clear they have product market fit. And that's kind of the first step. How do you build something that at least one human on the face of the planet will like? Then it starts sloping up. And when it starts sloping up, it's starting to diffuse more deeply into society in their case, but into a marketplace. And that's when you're trying to get the unit economics right inside of the business. That's kind of phase two. Phase one, product market fit, phase two, is, boy, what does it cost us to acquire a customer? So for an iPod, it probably costs them 50 bucks to acquire a customer. And the total lifetime value of a customer for them is probably 200 bucks. So they got the math to work. They got the unit economics to work. That's phase two, OK? Phase three is, boy, you got the math to work. Let's pour gas in this machine and grow the hell out of it while the growing's good. You've got lead on the marketplace. The marketplace is vast. Let's see if we can grow it like crazy. And then at some point, it starts to level out. Either you get disrupted by a new S-curve, or you disrupt it yourself, or just everyone in society has that. And, and so there's sort of four phases in any business that you build. There's that early product market fit. There's getting the math to work. And then there's growing it like hell. And then there's kind of the death phase. And we've seen at HubSpot, I guess my, my answer is, that there's different skills needed in, at different points. And you have to have the right people at the right time. And certain people run out of gas at different times. Right now, we're right here. You know, we're growing like crazy. We're pouring gas in it. You know, we're hiring, if I hire 50 people a month, we're just growing, growing. How do we grow as fast as we can without breaking the engine uh, effectively? But three, four years ago, we were, we were cautious. We weren't hitting the, the gas very hard because we were afraid, you know, we'd just run the thing right off a cliff. We didn't have the, the unit economics worked out in the business yet. At some point, I don't know when it will be down the road, you know, we'll start to flatten out. And then at that point, hopefully, we have our next S curve working or we disrupt it ourselves and have our S curve here. But I guess my ahas, what will be useful during your internship at BC is to figure out if you're into this type of stuff, boy, what kind of comp what is my, what am I like? Am I an early stage startup person where I'm good at getting the product market fit, building products, talking to customers, getting feedback, trying to get it to work? Or am I good at the math stage? Or Am I a scaler? Am I someone who likes to hire tons of people and build systems and processes that don't break? You know, and, and my big aha is different people work at different phases. <laughs> Great answer. Uh, so tell us about the culture code at HubSpot okay. and the role that culture and core values play in the way you enact your mission. Um, OK. So when I was at, at Sloan, we talked a lot about culture. And I didn't listen at all. I like tuned out. If culture came out, I just like, I started thinking about the Red Sox, the Grateful Dead, anything but culture. It's like a bunch of BS. And when we started HubSpot, we didn't, the word culture did not pass the lips of the founders in the first two and a half years. Of, we did not mention the word. And then two things happened at the same time. One is we did our first net promoter survey. And we asked our employees you know, the two questions. And the results of that were fascinating. So at the time, we probably had 30 employees. 
in 20, we had never, the word had never passed the lips of the founders. But in 25 of the 30 employees' feedback, they mentioned the word culture. So culture was a big deal. And we were ignoring it. And we, didn't, we thought it was a bunch of BS, or at least I did. Uh, at the same time, I had joined a CEO forum. It's a bunch of CEOs who get together once a quarter. It's like uh, seeing a she CEO shrink. Uh, <laughs> And one of the CEO, the topic of my first CEO forum, I, I couldn't have been more irritated, was culture. I was like, I joined this goddamn thing, and they're talking about culture as the topic? What a waste of time. And so I'm sitting in the meeting, thinking about the Grateful Dead and thinking about the Red Sox. And uh, there was one very sharp CEO, and there was actually only one sharp CEO in the group. <laughs> uh, and his name was Colin Engel. And he, is, does anyone know Colin? Yeah. He's the CEO of iRobot. They make the Roombas and the robots. And God, is he smart. Um, and he read me the riot act. He could tell I was thinking about the Grateful Dead and the Red Sox by the look on my face. And he said, you'll never scale. You'll never be able to scale your company unless you figure out your culture. Your culture is what enables people to make decisions when you're not in the room and you're not paying attention and you're not sort of guiding the conversation. It's their playbook. OK. So when you're wrong, you're wrong. So we got religion on this thing. And uh, we built. A deck. It's called the Culture Code. You should all look at it. That should be your own personal homework assignment. It's about 100 slides long. It takes about 20 minutes. You be breeze through it. And it's our U.S. Constitution. And so when the U.S. was founded, it was a new form of government. It was a new relationship between the people and the government. It was based on other governments and other things that had gone on loosely, but they wanted to create their own constitution of how the government was run. And so they wrote this long document. And the document expressed how the relationship between the government and the people work, people and the government, how we got all the stuff. And they made it in such a way that it could be amended. Tricky to amend, quite tricky in fact, but amendable. Um, and that's how we approached your culture deck. So we wrote this document and we labored on it and spent hours and hours arguing about the different sections, just like the, the founding fathers argued about the US Constitution. And we said, all right, that's it. And we published it. And we published it sort of as a, you know, as something that would change. So once a quarter, we take a part of our culture deck and we kind of pull it out. We argue, argue, argue about what's right or what's wrong. Are we not living up to the ideals of our constitution? Or are we too conservative in this way or too aggressive in this way? And we fight about it. And then we may or may not amend the constitution. It turns out it's getting harder and harder to amend the constitution as it goes on. It gets uh, better and better, I think. And so that's our culture code. And it's our playbook of how the employees and the company and the customers and the investors and how we think about the relationships of those things how we think the organization should work. And it's our, it's our vision of how do we build a company that we want to work at. The founders actually want to work there. I want to work there for 20, 30, 40 years. How do I build a culture that I would enjoy that will be high performance? And that's what the culture code is. Y'all should look at it. Just search on culture code or HubSpot culture code. So with a rapidly growing workforce that's spread around the globe, how do you motivate your people? And what are the challenges you face in a tight labor market? Uh, um, OK, a couple thoughts. I may be wrong about your generation, so I'm a, I'm, I'm a, you're millennials. I'm a Gen Xer. My impression of your generation is you're quite unique relative to my generation. And you're unique in ways that I think are very good. Uh, I'm one of the biggest millennial boosters out there. And one way in which I think you're unique is my generation cared a lot about money. I think your generation cares a lot about mission really concerned about the mission of the company. And so we've got, I think, a pretty good mission. You know, We think the way people market is really bad, and the way people sell is really bad, and needs to be transformed in a way that's better for the marketer and the seller, and it's better for the buyer on the other end. And so we're trying to transform two big, big industries. And I think that's a big motivator for people. They, if, you're, if your mission is to gouge the planet in a way to increase profits for your company and your investors, uh, or to gouge your customers in a way that's going to improve profits and, and increase your share price, boy, that's just not a very good motivator anymore, I think, for your generation. So we're big on mission. That helps a lot. I think people want to be on a winning team. The company's doing really well. I think it feels good for people to be on that winning team. Those are some of the things that have been working for us. So uh, I'll give you the, another <laughs> one. Uh, I think a lot, of companies, I, I, a lot of companies today, they spend an awful lot of time on their product. And how do we make a unique product that's unique from the competition that really solves a problem in the marketplace? And uh, when they do that, and they've got a really unique product, 
it's like a magnet that pulls in customers, right? You pull in tons of customers with your unique, great product. In today's workforce, the power of your products, the power of your business, is entirely in the hands of the workers you hire. And so the way I think about it is companies should spend almost as much time thinking about how do we create a unique culture that's fantastic, that is like a magnet that pulls in the best employees. If you create a great culture, it's like a magnet that pulls those employees in. So we spend an awful, awful lot of time on our culture, an awful lot of time thinking about how do we make this a great place to work, that we're going to love working there, our employees are going to want to love working there, our alumni will be proud that they're, that they're associated with and used to work at HubSpot. That's some of the stuff we're working on. That's great. <clears throat> so others who have sat in that seat, um, in fact, everyone complains about communications being the most challenging part of their job because no matter how much you do it and how hard you work at it, um, it never comes out quite the way you, you want it to. So I'm wondering how you communicate with your workforce, your executive team, your board, and other stakeholders. What do you find that's worked particularly well and what hasn't worked particularly well? Uh, let's see. There's one thing we've done that's worked well. Um, that we came up with a couple years ago. It's a it's the result of our annual planning process. So once a year, actually this time of year, we plan for the next five years. Like, oh, what do we want to be when we grow up? And, uh, and we build it into a document. It's called an M spot. You know, what's our mission? What's our strategy? What are the projects we're going to work on? What are the projects we're not going to work on? What are the metrics we're going to use to track it? And it's a, we try to get the whole strategy in one document. And uh, we spent countless hours working on it. You know, what is our mission? Is it changing or not? What are the projects we're going to fund this year? We're going to fund that project. That probably means we can't fund that other. Are we sure we want to do that? Which ones are we going to cut? Which ones are we going to stop investing in? Which ones are we going to triple down on? Uh, which part of the S-curve are we in? Uh, and so we spend a lot of time on that. And we put it in a document. And when that document is done, we publish it. And then it just cascades through the organization where every member of the organization builds their own M spot for their own function and their own team down to the very front line is you've got your own M spot and it should all roll up in foot with the corporate M spot. So if anyone's ever working on something that's like, you know, that sounds like an awesome project, but that's not part of my M spot. Just leave me alone about that. Um, and it's a very good tool for employees to manage me because I've always got crazy ideas and I've always got new things I want to do and talk about people and new things. And, and I'll go to my head of products like, why don't we build this thing to do that other thing and we could do this in a new market, da, 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 da. And then he'll come to me and he'll, I, I, you know you're in trouble if he's got the M spot printed out. He comes to and the, I don't see that on my M spot, <laughs> which means you know, if it's not, in the, it's not in the planning document, you can't do it. So that's a good way to keep everybody on the same page. The beginning of every board meeting we go through the M spot. Where are we? We do red, yellow, green on it. We are actually the last board meeting we did grades. And then at the beginning of every management meeting, we go through the M spot. Where are the gaps? Where are we falling down? That's been our, it's not that innovative, frankly. I think a lot of people do it, but that's been a very useful tool. So if you're hiring a new member of your executive team, what would you look for and how would you make sure they're a good fit with your culture? Mm -hmm. You may not have hired many new people lately. No. At that level. Uh, we've got about a 50-50 hit rate on hiring new executives. Um, uh, let's see. I would give you a couple thoughts. Um, I interview lots of people. So I'll, I've got, let's say I've got an opening for a head. We had a CIO opening recently. I'll interview 20 people, let's say. And at that level, it was a pretty good interview. You know, got their act together. Um, they went to all the right schools, they worked at the right company and read the right books and they're articulate and they're polished and they get all that, that stuff. And so I come out of the interviews sort of unfulfilled typically. And this is kind of up in the, this is particularly for a sales organization, this is tough, it's tough to interview a salesperson. Um, and so I dramatically discount my own and my peers' ability to interview someone and figure out if they're actually a good fit. And I dramatically overestimate people who have worked with that candidate before. And so I'll spend countless hours trying to find somebody who worked closely with that person that I'm connected to in some way and just talk to them. You know, what were they like to work with? Uh, did they get a lot done? Were they high GSD? Were they cultural? Like, what do you really know? So I rely an inordinate amount on, uh, I call it blind reference checks. And uh, that has served me pretty well. Where I've skipped steps on blind reference checks, I've been burned. Um, where I haven't, uh, yeah. 
And I think all people overestimate their ability in the interview. People interview a lot of folks, and they think they've really got it down. But if you look at the math on most people, they actually suck at it. And our ability to really determine who's good and who's not isn't very good. Uh, and so I'm a big believer in blind references. And I'm not a big believer in my own ability and skill to interview, nor of my team's ability to interview. Uh, I just think it's overrated. If you look at everyone, like the, the, the head of HR at Google uh, just wrote a new book. It's a very good book, by the way. Um, Laszlo Bach, I think it's the name of Bach. You would know. I, I anyway, don't know. Anyway, head of HR at Google. So that's a book you want to read. Google's really thoughtful about this stuff. And Google's big thing for years was just on brains. That's all they cared about. If you're smart, if you ace your SAT, they actually ask your SAT score. If you ace your GMAT, if you ace whatever test, uh, that's it. Oh, they didn't care about anything else. And what I thought was interesting about the book is they said, well, that proved to be wrong, that that didn't work, that that, that algorithm was broken. And now their criteria looks exactly like everyone else's criteria, uh, which I found frustrating, because I thought maybe they were onto something. Maybe there is a new way to do it. Um, so anyway, long-winded answer. But I, I'm a big believer in blind references. By the way, this extends to all of you. Let's say it's HubSpot, and we're going to extend you an offer. Before we extend you an offer, we definitely ask other BC uh, alums, hey, what's this person all about? And if you're one of the jerks in the class, and there's a couple of you here, uh, <laughs> we will find out. <laughs> and we will not hire you. And I bet you everybody else does the same thing. Um, if you're a real Sharpie, uh, we'll find that out too. So uh, how do you spend your time at work? Is there a typical week or day or the way you spend your time? No. That's one of the things I like about my job. I'm just going to look at my phone and see if we can find a typical day. There is no typical day. Uh, this, this morning I flew in from Bermuda. I spent the weekend in Bermuda, which was wonderful. Uh, and then, what the hell did I do today? Uh, I, I met with our uh, head of sales on a new initiative we're working on, our sales products. I had a good meeting with him. I spoke with my, my potential mentee, Jack Connors, uh, for a little bit. Uh, I prepared for this Q&A for a little bit. I s replied to a bunch of emails because they took last Thursday and Friday off. Um, yeah, I have no typical. But there's no typical. Yeah. So what part of your job do you like the most and what part do you like the least? Yeah. Uh, I like the most impact I can have. Uh, so on, this, on the, my S-curve, there's curve You guys remember the S-curve. Uh, <laughs> I like this part. I like the high growth part. Um, this is where I, I think I, I enjoy it, because you can impact a lot of people. So we have over 1,000 employees, most of which are doing pretty well and are quite happy. And many of whom are getting married and buying houses and their families are doing better. That's cool. Uh, we have 16,000, 17,000 customers, most of whom are quite happy and doing well, like the companies are doing well. They took a bet on HubSpot, and we really appreciate it, and it's paying off for most of them. For many of the individuals who made the bet, in many cases the VPs of marketing or directors of marketing, their careers have skyrocketed because of that decision. We have many partners who started with us as two, three per person companies who are now 100, 200 employee companies. It's the impact you can have as a bigger high growth company. That's by far the best. Uh, the worst parts, I, one thing I've worked on, people say you should work on your weaknesses. I don't buy that. I think you should lean into your strengths. If you're good at something, get better at it. Don't, is that one of your things? That's one of my things, too. Okay. Uh, so I work on my strengths, and I'm tired of fixing my weaknesses. They're too hard to fix. So I try to outsource all my weaknesses uh, to other people. And so the parts of my job I'm, I don't enjoy are also the ones I don't like. And we hired a COO, and he does a lot of this stuff. And we got all kinds of people to do the stuff I'm not very good at. Um, and so I've been effective in outsourcing this. You can't do that when you're first starting, but uh, I've been pretty effective at getting rid of the stuff I don't like. So um, what is it like to be in a meeting run by you? I'm very engaged. Shocking. Uh, I like to use the whiteboard. I like pictures. There's not a whiteboard at HubSpot without my handwriting on it right now. I bet you in the HubSpot, you go to every whiteboard, there's an S-curve on half of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, there's a great quote, I'm going to get it wrong, by, uh, by um, Teddy Roosevelt's, or uh, F, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's wife. Franklin Roosevelt's wife. Eleanor. Eleanor Roosevelt. You need to keep your feet on the ground and your head in the clouds, something like that. 
And that's the CEO's job, I think. It's like, you got to keep grounded and look for problems and stay diligent and look for potholes in the business and be a pain in the ass sometimes. But you also have to paint a compelling vision of the future and get people rallied around it, including your investors, including your employees, including everyone. And so it's this herky-jerky kind of balance where I feel like sometimes I'm really grounded, like I'm way grounded in like down under the ground looking at problems, digging into stuff. Other times I'm painting this big sort of vast rosy picture of how I hope things can be. I'm, I'm somewhat paranoid. Uh, we have made many mistakes in the history of HubSpot and we missed our numbers a couple times. And most of the mistakes were preventable. You know, we could, we, we made a mistake. We could have avoided it. We could have had better foresight, more creativity around the problem. We could have seen it earlier. And so I'm big on this concept of potholes. So if I little, see a little crack in the pavement, like one little number seems a little off, I will be like a dog on a bone until we fix that plot in the pavement because I don't want to turn into a giant pothole that the whole damn company is driving into. And so I am paranoid about uh, problems. And most of the problems, the heart, the reason that pothole started wasn't a piece of ice. It was uh, somebody not solving for EV tended to cause that or somebody not paying attention to the details. So you've already talked about culture, but if you could go back in time with the knowledge and experience you have today, are there any particular skills you wish you had focused a little bit more on? Mm -hmm. Computer software programming. It's like software is eating the world. Every industry is getting gobbled up by a software company now. Um, I was an electrical engineer. So I'll give you my story of why I'm not in software. I was an electrical engineer in undergrad. And I had a roommate, Ed Tinker. And we had the exact same um, classes. <clears throat> I probably put in 70 hours a week. I, was, I worked hard. Uh, and he put in about half, 35. He went to all the classes. He took notes. He finished his projects. He never studied. And uh, he was was summa cum, He was the number one in our class, summa cum laude. And I was a straight B student. Um, and it was from him that I learned that I that wasn't me. I couldn't build software. I wasn't genetically. It's like that's there's a different type of human that's good at that. That's not me. Um, but I, boy, I wish I were good at it because um, everything's being eaten by software. If you're a good software developer, the world is at your feet. So how do you relax in your spare time and do you have a favorite place to recharge? Mm. Yeah, tomorrow night I'm going to the Dead & Co. show. You going to the show? Uh, Wack? So this is Tim Wackenroo is one of my buddies back here. Um, my baseball Grateful Dead buddies. Uh, I go to Grateful Dead concerts. Honestly, people talk about this work-life balance thing. I don't have it. I really just don't have it. I've never had it. I work a lot. And you start, you, 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 asked a, you had a great Steve Jobs quote earlier. And he had another quote in that same speech at Stanford, the commencement speech, that said something to the effect of, live your own life. Don't live the life that everyone else expects you to live. Don't live the life your parents expect you to live. Don't live the life your dog expects you to live. Don't live the life that your grandparents expect you to live. Don't live somebody else's life. Live your own life to the way you want to, the way you think it should be. And so I've sort of, for better or worse, done that. And so I'm not central casting. I don't have a wife and two and a half kids, and I don't live in the suburbs and uh, uh, all that kind of stuff. I sort of am unique. Um, I'm still single, and I'm 48, never been married. Uh, not gay. Uh, <laughs> my mother just, you know, that's a good example. So I'm not living the life my mother wants, as I should say. <laughs> and uh, I think you should too. I think we get caught up in what our parents want us to do. We get caught up in what society wants us to do. We get caught up in a bunch of BS that doesn't matter. There's a great poet who said, the secret of life is enjoying the passage of time. I very much buy that. Does anyone know who the poet was? Well, it's in a James Taylor song. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> You're on fire. Today. Uh, so I have crap work-life balance. If you want to start a company and do what I do, you can pull it off and have a work-life balance if that's what you really want. That hasn't ever really been what I've wanted. I want that for my employees only because I think they want that for themselves genuinely because they're constantly talking about it. So we're working hard to create work-life balance for them. Uh, but I personally don't have it. Okay. If you could live your career over again, would you do anything differently? Yes. General manager of the Boston Red Sox. Really? Definitely. 
I would have done it. It's like a quant revolution that happened, and I was there at the right time, and <sighs> that would have been great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been okay, too. Yeah. Um, if you can choose a next career outside of the one you've got right now, what, what would it be? Uh, this, is, this is pretty good. I'm as happy as, as, as I've got a great job. I really enjoy it. enjoy the people I work with. I uh, enjoy the customers and the impact we're having. This is good.